Hello and welcome to Weathersnap. It's Thursday, the 1st of December, the first day of meteorological winter. I'm Claire Nazir and joining me today, Helen Roberts. Helen, what's coming up? Today, Claire, we're talking about how dull skies for many of us can induce what's called SAD. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Yes, SAD is a real thing. And what the intertropical convergence zone is and how it's impacting South America right now. And we've seen overnight temperatures as low as minus six earlier this week. So just how cold is it going to be over the course of this weekend and beyond? It really has been a shock to the system. I was doing the weather earlier today and I've started talking about wind chill, Helen. I mean, it's just like the sign of the times. December is here. December always seems to to sneak up on me. I can't believe we're into proper meteorological winter already. First of all, though, the past few weeks, we've been covering the stormy weather across the Mediterranean. We reported on Storm Denise earlier in November. That was named by the Spanish Met Service. And it tracked eastwards across uh, southern parts of Europe and with another low hot on its heels. And it became slow moving over Italy at the end of last week. And oh, my goodness, Helen, it's had massive impacts, hasn't it? Yeah, that's right. That rain really became overwhelming across parts of Italy, causing a landslide, devastating a small town on the southern island of Ischia. At least seven people have been killed and it happened just before dawn early on Saturday morning. How much rain was there, do we know? It was just a gargantuan amount of water that fell just in six hours, 126 millimetres of rain. Uh, So exceptionally wet after some very, very wet weeks before that. So the land was obviously just overwhelmed by that water, that rain. And it's a very hilly area, which doesn't help. According to officials, it's the heaviest rain they've seen in this part of Italy for the last 20 years um, with some tragic consequences. Earlier, I spoke to global guidance meteorologist Mark Sidaway to learn more about how this happened. The cause of all this is really the blocked weather across northern Europe. We've got a large anticyclone across uh, Scandinavia, western Russia. And what that's doing is it's sort of diverting the normal run of Atlantic weather that comes across northern Europe further south. Uh, so we're seeing uh, more unsettled conditions across Iberia and certainly through the central Mediterranean in recent weeks. And it's all added to by the sea is still quite warm down there. So when you start to see cold air go that far south, it does make for quite a vigorous mix and you can get some pretty intense storminess. And that's what we've seen around Italy, certainly for a couple of weeks now. Looking at the forecast, the block pattern continues through December. It does, yeah, in one form or another. As ever with blocks, they do move around a little bit uh, and that can make a big difference to quite where you get the worst of the weather. But certainly for the next week or so, we're looking at more storminess through the Mediterranean. And unfortunately, it could affect similar areas to those that have already been impacted. Let's um, head to South America and they're seeing a huge amount of thunderstorms, heavy rain, um, although they get a lot of wet weather. This is unseasonal. They have seen a lot of heavy rain recently across parts of South America, extending into the Caribbean as well. Trinidad and Tobago have seen a fair amount of rainfall. I suppose we are coming into that time of year where, as the ITCZ, this intertropical convergence moves south, they do expect an increase in rainfall. But even for that region, it has been exceptionally wet recently. And is it expected to continue? Certainly for the next week or so, we're looking at further thunderstorms, which could bring 100 to 200 millimetres in places, which is, is, you know, sort of a very wet month in the UK. But for that part of the world, it does happen. Um, So, yeah, it's a continuation and more of the same, unfortunately, for them. Explain to me what the intertropical convergence zone actually does and what parts of the world does it affect? Well, as the name suggests, it affects the tropics and this is where the trade winds basically meet each other. So in the northern hemisphere, you'd have northeasterly trade winds close to the equator. In the southern hemisphere, they would be southeasterly. So where they meet, this is where we call the intertropical convergence zone. And it moves north and south throughout the year with the season. In the northern hemisphere summer, it will move north. And then in the the, uh, northern hemisphere winter, it will move south into the southern hemisphere. And that's what we're seeing at the moment. How far south does it actually get? I mean, are we coming towards winter solstice? Is that the more southerly point of it? 
Yeah, it typically lags the sun by a month or two, so it'll probably be at its southernmost point sometime in the new year. Uh, it gets into South America, Central Africa, it can even fringe on northern peripheries of Australia at times as well. So those sort of latitudes, it tends to go a bit further south over land as well, uh, because land tends to heat up rather more quickly than the sea. So, yeah, those sort of latitudes. So that was Mark Sidaway from the Met Office Global Guidance Unit. That's right. So Mark talked about a blocked pattern across the UK and this is now affecting conditions across the UK going into the weekend. And Aidan has all the details in the outlook. Further wet weather is likely during the coming days across Italy because that's where low pressure has ended up with higher pressure across northern Europe. And it's that high over northern Europe that will increasingly exert its influence across the UK. Now, we've already seen the effects of that high pressure blocking weather systems this week from arriving from the Atlantic. So it's turned drier, but we've also seen some dense fog patches forming by night. And in some places, those fog patches have persisted into the afternoons. Now, through Friday and the weekend, as we see isobars around the area of high pressure tighten up, the easterly breeze will also strengthen and that will lead initially to less fog at night. But having said that, there'll still be a lot of cloud feeding in on the easterly breeze and that cloud increasingly through the weekend will bring with it showers. Those showers mostly affecting eastern and central parts of the UK, one or two making their way further west. And during Saturday and Sunday, it really will be rain, even though these showers are coming through on an easterly breeze and it's December, we're not expecting any significant snowfall away from the tops of the Pennines and the tops of the Scottish mountains. Nevertheless, it will feel cold in that easterly, so temperatures on Saturday and Sunday typically around five to seven degrees, but you can knock off a few degrees when you take into account the wind chill effect. Later Sunday, some of those showers will become aligned to form more persistent spells of rain and mountain snow. And as we start off next week, an area of low pressure over the continent could throw up some more persistent areas of rain into the southeast, which, if heavy and persistent enough, could end up being a bit sleety. Now, after Tuesday, there's some divergence in what the computer models are saying. Some computer models want to keep the east to southeast of the airflow, so keeping things cold, but nothing exceptionally cold for the time of year. However, a majority of computer models are now signalling for the winds from Wednesday onwards to come around more to a northerly direction. That would pull in even colder air all the way from the Arctic. If that happens, later next week we're likely to see lower temperatures by day and by night, and the chance of snow at lower levels, not just confined to hills and mountains. Now, of course, it's too early to give specifics on the likelihood and extent of any snowfall, particularly given the divergence in these computer model runs. But if we get a northerly next week, it would be a marked contrast compared with the weather earlier in the week and, of course, the very mild weather that we've seen through autumn. And any snowfall to lower levels in this country can cause significant impacts. So we'll be monitoring it very closely over the next few days and we'll keep you updated right here at the Met Office. So the outlook, yes, it's time to layer up, it really is. Um, going back to November just for a moment, Helen, the rainfall statistics spoke volumes for the lack of sunshine over the last few weeks. And now we're plagued with cloud again. So let's just have a look at those numbers to see how they stack up. For the second half of the month, I don't know if you remember, we went from warm and sunny to dull and wet. And what were the key numbers? Well, northern England was most dull in comparison with average. So northern England had just 73% of its sunshine hours in November. So that was 43.6 hours in total. Northern Ireland, on the other hand, had 19% more sunshine hours than average, 64.5 in total. So quite a different feel across different parts of the UK. And in fact, the UK as a whole the stats showed slightly below average, around 94%, but as we've already said, dullest areas were generally across northern parts of England. 
to me, it really has felt like it's been, um, at least over the last few weeks, really very grey. And it could be because actually 2022 has already seen more than an average year's worth of sunshine. And of course, we've still got a whole month to go. So it might just be, Claire, that any dullness feels more prevalent just because we've had quite a sunny year on the whole. That's true. And in fact, I live in the northwest of England where you, we tend to get more in the way of cloud. I remember when we moved up about 10 years ago, my daughter, two years old, we arrived and it was so wet, so cloudy. And I remember about a month into us being there, she pointed at the sky and said, Mummy, look, blue. I just thought, <laughs> yes, oh my goodness. Wow. That is a, it's a testament to where we are now, my darling. But anyway, um, she wasn't suffering from what we call sad. Mm. Uh, she just thought that's very unusual to see a bit of blue sky in uh, over the horizon. But it's something which we have to be conscious of at this time of year, Helen, because we're coming into the darkest months uh, where we're not going to get as much sunshine anyway. And so that's limited the amount of solar radiation we can expose ourselves to. First of all, Helen, tell me what SAD stands for. So SAD is Seasonal Affective Disorder, and there are various levels of this disorder. I mean, officially, it's a clinical diagnosis, but people can suffer with some of the effects of seasonal affective disorder. In fact, some research suggests around one in three people do struggle through the autumn and winter months with some type of seasonal depression. And as I said, it can vary from mild to severe, but typical symptoms include low mood, a loss of interest in things you normally enjoy, a change in appetite, which on the whole tends to be eating more than usual. And similarly with sleep as well, as change in sleep patterns, perhaps sleeping more than you normally would. And there's a lot of different evidence and research around what actually causes SAD. Um, it's likely to be complex and multifaceted as these things often are. I came across some fascinating research on, would you believe it, the colour of people's eyes. Now, this study showed that people with darker eyes, brown or, or dark brown eyes, tended to be significantly more affected by seasonal affective disorder than those with blue eyes. And it might be to do with the sensitivity of the retina. People with lighter coloured eyes don't need to absorb as much light as those with darker eyes for the lights to reach the, the retinal cells. So some really fascinating research there. That's just incredible, isn't it? That, I mean, obviously uh, as a society, we're just so diverse. Um, in the summer, some of us go pink, some of us go brown, depending on exposure to sunlight. And I'm a mixed race and my skin, you know, really needs that sunlight. But I didn't ever, I never really thought about it in terms of eye color. But I think the key thing is, as we draw into these, these months, is to be very conscious that this could be a thing, a thing that could affect you and not only stay sort of up to date with the forecast, but if you see it's going to get really cloudy and uh, quite dull for days on end, if not weeks, there are things that you can do, aren't there? So uh, what's the obvious one? Yeah, I mean, the obvious one is just getting outside and trying to get more in the way of light and exposure to particularly natural light. There is some evidence for what are called sad lamps and sitting in front of these for half an hour or an hour a day can, can sometimes be very beneficial. But really, the best thing we can do is try and get outside. And research shows that not just getting the natural light, but combining it with things like exercise, social interaction and appreciation nature all of these things can be so beneficial and if you can combine them into one thing then that's got to be good and also I came across some interesting research about the benefits of humour as well which I really like so you can imagine that getting outside maybe listening to a comedy podcast maybe going out with a friend and really appreciating nature while you do so and having a little jog all of those things combined have got to be a good thing. So when it comes to humour, it's not pranking the person you're sitting next to at work. Obviously not. In fact, um, this is not scientific, but I've um, had a conversation about early morning walks. And when you're when you're exposed to sunlight, that sort of really sort of kicks in your circadian rhythm and you become awake and aware. So I think stepping out and just getting that bit of fresh air is good anyway. We don't want to be staring at a screen all day. Anything to add value to these dark months. I mean, 
you know, meteorological winter is only three months, but it always feels a bit longer, doesn't it? Don't really feel that spring is in the air until those first little cumulus clouds just appear over the land rather than the sea. So signs of spring is not something I should be talking about now. It's all about winter and Christmas. But even so, that's really interesting. Thank you, Helen. So let's have a look and see how sunny it was last week. Our very own Jeff Norwood Brown, who normally hosts the Mostly Weather podcast along with Helen, he's here now with last week's highs and lows. Take it away, Jeff. The warmest place was on Saturday the 26th when Kinloss in Moray reached 14.5 degrees. The lowest temperature was during the early hours of the morning of Wednesday the 23rd of November in Aviemore in the Nesha where it dipped to minus 5.9 degrees. The highest rainfall in 24 hours was on Thursday the 24th of November when Aknagart in Ross and Cromarty saw 46.6 millimetres. And the highest daily sunshine also occurred on Thursday in Camborne, Cornwall, with 9.8 hours of sunshine. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks to Helen, regular voice on Weather Snap as well as Mostly Weather. I'm Claire Nazir, and editor this week is Adrian Holloway. Thank you for listening. Weather Snap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.